This is uh, week five of this message series. Um, as we're going through it, we've been looking what is uh, uh, ultimately the beginning of the story of the gospel from Mark and recognising that the congregation, the people to whom Mark is addressing his gospel, are people who are struggling. Many of them had been Jews. And because they were Jews, they had a strict adherence, or at least a, a very strong link with the temple and synagogue. And now they'd been rejected. They weren't allowed to go to the synagogue. They weren't allowed to partake in any of the traditional uh, liturgical services and worship that they would have been a part of for the whole of their story. And if they were people who were living in Rome or other parts of the uh, empire, they were being persecuted and not just being called names, they were being put to death for the sake of the gospel. And so within this whole community, there is this sense of saying, what's happening? Where does this take us? What's going to happen out of all this? And so the new ways of God is a reminder to us that when God and his plan for our community, our world, is being put into place, it doesn't happen as we would like to say, dot, 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 or point, point, point. It happens in a way we do not expect. And so these parables in the first week that we listened to, the parables of the sowing of the seed, they were to stories told to the people. But at the end of that, we're told that Jesus recognised that he would use parables he spoke the word to them as far as they were capable of understanding it. He would not speak to them except in parables. They didn't know what was going on, but hopefully as they listened, an awareness would start to arise in them, a question would arise in them, and they would start to wonder what this message was about. I suppose if everything is explained to us without us thinking about it, we never really grasp what it means. And so to understand God's plan, we have to keep hearing the challenges being presented to us so that we see more than just, or hear more than just the words. What does it actually mean for me? And we would live that out through that second Sunday where we heard the story of the disciples in the boat with Jesus and they're sailing on the sea that many of them had been quite familiar with and yet suddenly they're in a storm and what's really happening? How are they going to survive and after Jesus calms the storm, he simply looks at them and said, why didn't you have faith? We know they did, but it wasn't immediately obvious to them that it was going to be okay. They had to reach out, try to find an answer for themselves. Lord, save us. But Jesus already knew what was going on. The plan was already in place. They weren't going to be lost. But they didn't have the faith that said, I don't have to ask. So it's a kind of conundrum. Do you ask God for help? Or do you trust that God's going to help you? They asked when it got too difficult, rather than having faith saying, it will be all right. So I suspect that that's a, a challenge for some of us at times as well. Um, we don't believe that God will help us, and we start to panic. And so then our prayer becomes almost the prayer of the foxhole, as we desperate we desperately start praying rather than trusting in God. Which is the opposite of last Sunday's gospel, where the woman was there, sorry, the weekend before, where the, where the woman came along and she said, all I've got to do is trust, touch his cloak and it will be all right. She knew that coming to Jesus was all she had to do. And we know that she was healed. We also know that Jairus, as he came to ask Jesus to come and heal his daughter, he knew that if Jesus came, his daughter would be saved. So it was just saying to God, this is what I need, and then sitting back and letting God do it. And it, for both of them, it happened quite powerfully. Which was the opposite for last week. The topsy-turvy story of what it means to be faithful people. Jesus goes to his own community and starts to talk to them. And they suddenly, they hear what he's saying, and they're saying... This man is saying something quite different, quite profound, different from our, our normal teachers. He's saying something quite different. And then this realisation hit them, but hang on, we know who he is. He grew up here. He was not like this as a kid. He was ordinary. He did the things that children do. 
And now he is speaking to us with this wisdom and understanding. And Jesus walked away from them astounded at their lack of faith. I suspect that there are many people in our world today who have a great deal of wisdom, a great deal of knowledge, a great deal of the gifts to be able to help people who are basically rejected by the community because they don't fit a particular type of uh, position or type of understanding. So the challenge for us is how do we accept those in our community who are prophetic voices, people who have something to say to us that can really and profoundly change our world. The first reading today speaks of another occasion, something similar, where Amos, who is a shepherd of sycamores, just a, a farmer, is suddenly told by the Lord to go out and to begin to tell the people this is what it's about. The Lord said to me, he says, go and prophesy to my people Israel. He didn't look for a job of a prophet. In fact, he says to Amaziah, the prophet, he says, I didn't come here to take away your work. I didn't come here to take over your position or prestige. I was sent to tell the people. And his message was a message that said, justice and integrity are important and not simply saying what people want to hear. And we know that the role of the prophet isn't the one who says, this is what's going to happen and it'll all be nice and comfortable. The prophet is the one who dares to put in our faces the possibilities that are challenging and sometimes quite difficult to address. So Amos was powerful in his statement. In the gospel, we hear Jesus say to his disciples, go out and preach. Mark doesn't tell us, he just says preach repentance for the forgiveness of sins, which is obviously the message of Jesus, a change of heart, a new beginning, a whole new way of living. But Mark also puts in a whole lot of other things and he tells them, don't take any purse, don't take any haversack, don't take any extra clothes, don't take a whole lot of things. He's basically saying, be vulnerable. Be open to what's going to happen. Because if you're going to be prophets of the new covenant, prophets calling people to turn a change of heart, to metanoia, then you have to be prepared for whatever is going to be thrown at you. Don't have protection. Don't have, I suppose, a comfort spot you can fall back to in case of problems. And he even says to them, if something goes wrong, shake off the dust from that town and go to the next place. Be confident that what God is asking you to do is his will, not yours. It's his plan, not yours. Next weekend we'll be told almost in the first line of the gospel, they came back rejoicing for what God had done through them. And so obviously they heard the message. They accepted this invitation and this challenge to go out and to hear the good news. And they did it and came back rejoicing. The other thing that's really important for us to remember is that when God calls us to a new way of living, he's inviting us to say, please do it. I frequently, when I frequently refer back to the meme that came out not long after Pope Francis was elected, you had a picture of Pope John Paul II, Pope Benedict and Pope Francis. And under the photo of Pope John Paul II is, this is what we believe. And under Benedict it has, this is why we believe it. And under Francis it says, now do it. And it's kind of the real call to us at this time is do we sit and learn or ponder about what the gospel means or do we go and live it? As Jesus is talking to the disciples today, he's saying, go and live what the gospel is about. So I wonder what would happen if today we went out from here, not necessarily two by two, but if we went out from here and we took this message of a call to change our hearts, would we have the courage to go out and to speak to people by our words and by our deeds what it really means to be witnesses of the gospel? Do we have the confidence that says we would actually be doing God's will? Would we be making the new plan of God something visible and active 
in our community? Or will we stop and say that's somebody else's job? I'm sorry to say this, my friends, it's your job. I have two friends and they have slight com variations of the same th thing. One person says, if you've got a heartbeat, you're a disciple. And the other says, if you're breathing, you can make an impact in the lives of others. Saying the same thing. We are called to be disciples and witnesses in our world. And that's the invitation, the challenge, whatever, to each one of us. I've left the middle reading, the letter to the Ephesians, to the last because it's a, a whole message series in itself. If you want to really think about and read what Paul's theology is about and what Paul's message is about, just reread that second reading at some stage over the next couple of days. And you'll find that it's so packed with power and uh, challenge to us, but it's packed with his belief, his understanding of what God has done for us. And it's primarily based around the language that I've used many times before. God wants a personal relationship with us. He's created the scene so that we can actually be one with him. And what he wants from us is a response that says yes to that invitation. So the letter to the Ephesians, those first verses from chapter 1 of that, that letter are powerful words for all of us. And I'd encourage you to take them and listen to them because they're telling us what it means to be a disciple, what it means to be loved by God.